So we welcome uh, Ben Connolly. He's a Soto Zen, uh, Zen Buddhist priest and teacher. He also provides secular mindfulness training in many contexts and works with multi-faith groups focused on intersectional liberation, racial justice, and climate justice. Ben is based at the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center, travels to teach across the United States, and has written three books. And like I said, I have placed a website link to those books for you to look at that later in chat. So thank you so much, Ben, for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, it's nice to see you all. Uh, I'm going to stick with the gallery view so I can see you all. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's good to be here. I hope you're doing well. You know, the last couple of years and even the last few weeks have been extremely stressful for some people. So if that is the case for you, I just want to extend my heart to you. And for those of you who are not feeling that, that's that's fine too. You can. There's nothing wrong with feeling okay. <laughs> so uh, we come together however we are. And uh, yeah, you know, theosophy, it's kind of fun to be here. I don't. I have, I've only read a little bit of theosophy stuff, and um, I did just encounter, I was reading a book called Engaged Buddhism, which is about movements uh, where there's an intersection of people who are Buddhist practitioners and movements for liberation. And I'm pretty sure I encountered a long chapter on the husband of Madame Blavatsky. Um, so you probably know lots about this. And <clears throat> apparently he did some pretty awesome stuff uh, about focusing on helping people be free from oppressive structures, which I think is uh, good work to do because uh, I'm a Mahayana Buddhist. So uh, Soto Zen is a sect of Zen and Zen is a Mahayana Buddhist school and Mahayana means great vehicle. And that means uh, we're involved in creating a vehicle um, that is large enough for everyone to be accommodated together on the path of liberation, uh, or perhaps the giant boat in which we can all get and go out onto the ocean of liberation. Or maybe it's like a really cool airplane, but that sounds pretty high tech. So I'm going to stick with maybe a boat. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's what's motivating to me. Um, and we have a topic for today, which is uh, about non-duality and non-self, which are common themes in Buddhist thought. So that's really where my training and knowledge is, is uh, Buddhism. And I study a pretty broad swath of Buddhist traditions, which is not always true for some Zen, Zen practitioners might be in kind of a narrower impression. But anyway, uh, yeah, so non-self, non-duality, and no-self are all um, common terms within Buddhist thought that I suspect have some substantial influence on theosophical thought. And they're often sort of mushed together, which is kind of fine. But they're actually quite distinct in the early body of Buddhist teaching. So I'm going to start by talking them as as quite distinct. So in the earliest layer of uh, Buddhist um, teachings, which is known as the Pali Canon, <clears throat> which is associated with the modern Theravada and Vipassana movements, um, there's a big emphasis in there on the idea of uh, realizing non-self, non realizing non-self. And I should say that all of the things I'm going to say are based in the basic idea of Buddhism, which is that there's suffering and you can do something about it. So the main concern is alleviating suffering. So Buddhism is essentially a body of medicine, but it's not physical medicine. It's a medicine for the way our consciousness experiences reality. So anyway, uh, in this early Buddhist teaching, there's this big emphasis on non-self as being a really effective medicine for promoting non-suffering or promoting liberation from suffering. So what this refers to is um, a process of investigating the totality of what we experience and realizing that there's nothing within that field of experience that is worthy of being considered one's self. And the thing is, it's 
this is used in a very technical way. So the word we're translating as self is Atman, which in a lot of Indian thought is would often be translated as soul. Uh, but the main idea is it's sort of like a lasting, permanent, um, and thing with agency. <clears throat> and so uh, the idea is if you look around at your experience, you'll just notice there's nothing within the field of your experience that lasts. Everything is just flux. And you might go and investigate your experience and find something else, which is fine with me. But this body of teaching says, if you look using the means they offer you, which is mindfulness, Mindfulness is a very technical, detailed, psychological, and phenomenological investigation of the contents of experience. And you go through all the many modes of investigation, you'll just find there's nothing in here that is actually myself. There's just kind of some stuff happening. And uh, the thing is, the argument is, if you do that, you will not suffer anymore because you won't have anything to defend or protect uh, from some kind of impinging universe. So normally, I don't know about you, I experience the world, I'm like, I'm sitting here, I feel like I'm a being, which is a consciousness that kind of is located inside uh, a body, which sort of looks out at the world through a bunch of sense organs, and then is constantly being like, oh, this is really nice, I want to get some more of it, or no, I don't like that, and can I get rid of it? Um, and of course, this ends up being pretty frustrating because the things we don't like keep coming back uh, and the things that we do like always go away with absolute certainty. So, uh, <clears throat> so it's like, well, since that, the way of just trying to hold on to things or push them away is ineffective at promoting human welfare, what about this other method that would be realizing that there's nothing in the middle that's actually a solid thing that's separate from it. So one way this, this idea of non-self or anatman is summed up really beautifully is in a commentarial Theravadan text by Buddha Gosa. So he says, uh, there is suffering, but there is not one who suffers. There is suffering, but there is not one who suffers. But it's just like, which is really interesting, uh, kind of a, so that, but what this, the implication of this is, um, this body of teaching, early Buddhist teaching, affirms that there's stuff. It affirms a kind of what we would consider to be exterior or some kind of flux of phenomena, but it says there's not a self which has to suffer because of it. So, and you know, if you think about like all kinds of other spiritual teachings, you can see commonalities. I mean, as a person who's like a recovering addict, been in spiritual programs about recovery from addiction, there's huge emphasis put on shedding the self and self-centeredness. Um, so yeah, there's this, we could say like an effacement of the self. Although the argument of this tradition is you, if you look, closely, you'll just see that there isn't a self there. So, uh, and what precisely self means, you know, generally speaking, it's something that is permanent. Uh, because, you know, some people think that like, after you die, there's like this self that's going to go on, you know, doing all kinds of cool stuff. I could be true. I don't know. Um, but it, Buddhism, early Buddhism says, it's not true. <laughs> Pretty much <laughs> straight up. So that's your non-self. Um, so then uh, you get kind of a, you could compare it to like the, the, the Christian Reformation or something like that. A big shift or a very different body of teachings emerges in Buddhism uh, about 500, 600 years after the time of the Buddha, which is called Mahayana Buddhism. So this early Buddhist tradition is focused on these practices that help you realize non-self. And then ah, uh, you get, you, you're like free from suffering. And then what you wanna do is just serve your community. It's pretty cool. Sounds pretty nice. Um, 
But the problem was that there came to be like a cultural impression that people were becoming too, they're like, I'm just going to do my meditation so much and see through the self and then I'll get free. And so all these people were disappearing into the woods and just meditating all the time. And it, people were like, that, that doesn't seem very culturally helpful. We want someone to like hang out in town and, and mow the lawn. So the Mahayana Muda movement was kind of a, a, trying to get people more engaged doing Buddhism that was more engaged with a collective model of liberation instead of this personal realization that gets you free. So that's why it's, Mahayana is a great vehicle. It's a collective uh, model. And one of the uh, things that comes out of this is a shift from focusing on realizing non-self, which is realizing there's nothing within the flux of experience that is yourself, to what I will call no self, which is realizing that nothing at all has independent separate existence. <clears throat> so that's weird. Uh, you say, well, that's weird way of looking at things. But, you know, the easiest and most common arguments for this are just to think about how any particular thing is entirely dependent on an unnameably infinite number of other things. So this is why the famous uh, beloved uh, Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh likes to he'll say, well, if, if I look at this piece of paper I'm reading off to give my talk, I can see in it the sun on which it depends, and I can see in it the rain on which it depends, and I can see the tree on which it depends, and I can see the hands of the person that ran the machine that uh, ground up the tree, and I can see the trucks that brought the oil that brought to the gas station to run the trucks that drove the piece of paper to get here and the people who drove the trucks and their children and they wouldn't maybe be driving those trucks if they didn't have children to support and then the thing is you can go on forever you can go on forever with any particular anything within your own emotional field the way you're thinking or things you think are absolutely real physical objects and do this analysis and realize that thing that you look at as a separate thing is just your way of looking at a flux of relationships and picking something out of it and saying that is real and lasting. And so the point is, that's just a perspective that you have. It's not a real true thing that whatever you've picked out as being separate is. And it's not lasting because you can just see everything is always changing. Um, this is easier to think of now when we have like a materialist scientific mindset. You can just look at the atomic structure of anything and be like, it's all movement. Um, it's mostly space. Uh, that's not the argument that Buddhists use, but they'd be happy to use it because any way of helping us see that what we think is a, is a bunch of fixed objects that bump up into each other help us to see that's false is, is good. Why? Because if there aren't objects, there's nothing to grasp and there's nothing to push away. So where are you going to get suffering? It's like, oh, this isn't a world of crappy things to try and get rid of or cool. There's no things. Uh, there's just relationships flashing by. So... Uh, by the way, this is not the what we're usually teaching. So you might be like, this guy is really weird. What is he up to? So, you know, I'm just dumping it, jumping into the, the freaky stuff here from Buddhism because that's that was the talk title I was given. <laughs> Maybe I made it up. I can't remember, Paul. I don't know what we're doing. Anyway, so. No, I made it up. <laughs> oh, okay. That's cool. I'm with you. So he made it up. <laughs> non-self, no self. So the distinction is that with the non-self idea from early Buddhism, what we're doing is seeing that there nothing is our self. No self is to see that there is nothing that has independent separate existence. So everything 
already has no self, or we might say no self nature. And so Buddha Gosa in this early tradition, focusing on, on non-self says, there's suffering, but no one who suffers. And then later on, we get the, one of the central kind of summations of this idea of no self, which says there's no suffering. Uh, and that's a that's a you know a claim that's kind of hard to take, right? I mean, I just like it's, it hasn't been an hour since I was like ornery about something, and uh, clearly there is huge amounts of suffering happening in the world. Um, you know, there's this brutal war happening in Ukraine, and there's a brief cessation of the war in Ethiopia, and there is massive poverty and oppression happening in Afghanistan. And, you know, we could just go on and on. Um, so there's like uh, 2 million people or more in prison in the United States, the largest prison population in the world by people and by uh, percentage. <clears throat> what are, what's going on? It, it's not, I've been to prisons because I used to teach meditation there. It's terrible. So... And, you know, we could just go on. So this claim, like there's no suffering, that just seems um, crazy. Uh, but the point is that we can see that whatever thing in any moment we've turned into suffering and are holding on to isn't quite what we think it is. So we can realize that we are ascribing by our way of looking at things, uh, meaning to things, and that's what makes them what we think they absolutely are. The main point here is that we take things to be absolutely true when they are not, and that we will be way more free, way more happy, and way more effective at being beneficial to people if we can realize that the things we think are true aren't absolutely true, they're conventionally true. So it's reasonable to call it suffering. But the thing is one person's suffering is another person's justice. So people have differing perspectives and uh, we can learn to, to meet people where they are instead of meeting them with our overlay of absolute truths that we have. So, but probably easier to get one's mind around is that understanding no self allows us to experience a world where there's nothing to grasp or push away. <clears throat> so, lastly, for the topic that came across my plate, I don't play baseball, but if I did, I'd be like, Hey, ba -da -ba -da. Um, non self. I threw in no self uh, and then non duality. So, non duality, uh, there's intimations or hints that non duality is a part of the Buddhist tradition in the earliest Buddhist layer, but it's not emphasized. Um, it becomes emphasized more in uh, a school of uh, Mahayana Buddhism called Yogacara, which is my area of expertise, so it's my favorite. Um, so non-duality can be variously understood and it's actually understood in lots of different ways across different religious traditions. But the term advaya, uh, ah means not and dvaya means dual, um, permeates uh, Indian thought in the first millennium. It becomes really influential on what's called Advaita Vedanta, which is a Hindu movement. And, uh, but it's a big deal in this Mahayana coming through this, what's called this Yogacara tradition. So non-duality, at root, it just means looking at something you think is dual and realizing it is not. So what will happen sometimes is you'll people, hear people talking about non-duality and what they'll mean is oneness. That's called monism. That is not Buddhist non-duality. 
that's just monism with a different name or oneness. So you'll occasionally come across discussion of oneness or mention of it uh, within Buddhism, but non-duality is something much more weird and hard to get your mind around than oneness. Um, because uh, non if we say non-duality means anything that you think is, is, uh, has an opposite can't be. So that's to say, like, if I think there's a me and there's a you, and we say, well, that's just a duality. It's not absolutely true. Um, then I could be like, oh, well, you and me are one. But that's a ridiculous claim because I have no idea what you're thinking right now. You might be like thinking like, uh, did I put my laundry in? Or you might be thinking, this guy is very long-winded. Or you might be thinking, oh, I'm just grooving on this. This really reminds me of, I don't know what you're thinking. And, and I cannot, I cannot know your experience. So a claim that, that non-duality means we're one, is, it's just doesn't work. But what non-duality is, is a way of describing more accurately how things are. Because the basic idea is that dualism is a product of the way we view the world or think about it. So I think, um, uh, what would be a good example? Uh, I'm a dummy and my brother is really smart. And I might be like just caught on that idea. And you can see how then, then I'll act dumb just to live up to my expectations of myself and I'll project on him that he knows everything. And I'll miss all the opportunities where we could actually have a genuine interaction because I'm just meeting us where we are. Uh, or we might say we have a duality between men and women. Um, and you might be like, yeah, well, men and men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And uh, well, that's great, but what about the multiple non-binary gender students that I have? What are they? Do they not exist? Pretty sure they do. Um, so non-duality allows us to kind of cut through, again, certainties, like things that we think are, are absolutely real. So it can be like a logical tool where you go, oh, I'm thinking of this dualistically, but these things actually can't exist without each other. So, or another example, oh, this is a good one. It's, it's we're ending winter. Are you ready for spring? I am. And so I'd be like, yeah, you know, in May, they're going to be flowers and that will be great. The flowers are the spring. That's the thing I like. And it's not winter, which is, well, I like winter, but we'll pretend I don't like winter, which is like cold and, and there are no flowers and it sucks. But the thing is, you can't have spring without winter. It's, it's a meaningless thing. It wouldn't be spring if there hadn't been winter. And... It never happens that way. So either way you slice it, the idea that those things are separate is just a way of looking at it. Another way to look at it is they're non-dual, but that doesn't destroy them. So if non-duality destroys duality, it's not non-dual. That's the weirdest part. That's why it's really annoying to talk about because I say, the spring and the winter are inseparable, and that's what makes them distinct. The spring and the winter are inseparable and non-dual, and that's why they're different. So once you start talking about this, it does seem really weird. Um, but, it, you know, uh, one of my uh, heroes is Audre Lorde, who is like kind of one of the pioneers of intersectional feminist theory. And Audre Lorde was really into non-dual thought. She learned it through Taoism and the Tao Te Ching and some early Buddhism. Uh, and she, uh, that's one way she, she brings this into a practical expression. She says, without community, there is no liberation. Uh, so without community, there's no liberation. There has to be some kind of seeing through all these dualities that keep us apart. But she says, without community, there is no liberation, but community must not mean a shedding of our difference, nor the pretense that they do not exist. 
So, you know, sometimes people will say like, oh, you know, we're all just one, you know, white, black, yellow, brown. I, I don't see any differences. And it's like, we're, we're not going to get free from the oppressive racial systems we live in with that attitude because people do see those differences and they act on them and the way people have inherited wealth and had access to jobs and all are affected by that. So it's possible to both see that we are a community, that the dualities that keep us apart can be seen through while also seeing that we're different and distinct kinds of people. And this is uh, the way uh, non-duality can be applied or an example of applying it. So having said that, the another in the last little thing I'm just gonna in my long peroration here is uh, non-duality is sometimes talked about in sort of seeing, as I'm talking about it here where there, we have an idea that there's a this and a that that are separate and we use non-duality to see that they're inseparable and that's what enables them to be distinct. Uh, but the other common usage of non-duality comes back to this original thing I was talking about of non-self and no-self. Because in non-self, the self is effaced or the self is seen through. So there's no self, but there are phenomena. And with no-self, we see that the phenomena are not actually phenomena. They're, in, they're not separate things. And non-duality is like, we're just gonna see through the separation between the self and the object and realize that there's not uh, objects out there that I'm seeing and there's not a me seeing objects. And uh, this is like, for a lot of people who've like studied kind of like cool, mystical, uh, religious literature or even non-religious spiritual mysticism be like oh yeah that's the thing um, it's a very uh, influential understanding of what non-duality means to see through uh, the illusion that there's a self that's separate from objects and uh, this is summed up in in a yoga chara text it says uh, we see non-duality, which is to both see that there is no self, which is seeing objects, and seeing there are no objects which are seen. And when I say that, you go, oh, what is that, like just total blankness? And no, not at all. It's just exactly what you're experiencing already, because all the dualities between you and the objects are already just ways of looking at things. They're already non-dual. You don't have to wait to have non-dual awareness because you can't have any other kind. That's the teaching of the tradition I'm from. It's too late. You don't like having non-dual awareness? Well, you can't make a genuinely dual awareness. You can only make a belief in the illusion of the dualities that you see. So, uh, I think that's like good for me, just like going off on a, on a spiel. That's probably solid for a Zoom meeting. So I'm just kind of, it would be fun to hear from other people. I would welcome um, reflections or questions or just anything. And I think you could just open up your mic and say stuff. I, I'm going to read. I'm uh, sitting in the chat. Yes, I'm going to read oh. what's in the chat. So. Non-duality, sort of the two sides of a coin, one thing but distinct characteristics. Ella asks. I like I like your um, I like your metaphor, your kind of symbol, Ella, because yes, with a coin, you can't have a coin with just the heads, right? It's not not possible. So, like we think there's a heads and a tails. And that's true, but there's also heads tails. Uh, so there's there's the so we start to be able to see multiple perspectives of the same object. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. That's I think that's a nice nice way of looking at it. Okay, good.
Anybody uh, else? Okay, go ahead. Everybody too fried to come up with a question. So my, I'm gonna just gonna say my favorite topic is non-duality. My mm. husband and I actually debate this and talk about it. Um, I guess we would be probably, mm, I have a lot of yoga background uh, the, uh, and my husband would be Taoist, I guess, mm. if you're gonna classify. Um, so that's why I, so Paul and I talked, but then I took what he said and I guess probably came up with the phrasing. Um, so I do also hang out with a lot of people who talk about underneath everything, we are all one. There's only one. Mm -hmm. So how is the, uh, you know, maybe that's a simplification, but how is the, how do all those things come together? Because in a way, hmm, Taoists would say there is all illusion, that there's only one but it's not a happy, I mean, like, my feeling is it's not exactly a happy one, like the new age, la, 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 we're all one, da, da. Um, so I just, I, I'm just throwing that out there as asking, because you did give a really do, good, you made a really good distinction. I want to hear that again a little, or expand on that. Yeah, sure. Oneness. So, well, <clears throat> you know, oneness can be, it's just another perspective. So all the stuff I'm saying isn't, I don't think it's absolutely true. That's for sure. Cause it's just a bunch of dualities. Like as soon as I say the word duality, you can't hear that without in your mind thinking there's a non-duality, which would be a different thing. And when I say thing, there has to be stuff that isn't things. So as soon as you open your mouth, you're engaging in duality. So I, I I'm free of having to arrive at any ultimate truths from it because of my tradition, <laughs> I feel very fortunate. <laughs> um, so, uh, but that was leading. So my point being that talking about oneness can be helpful. And so within the Buddhist tradition and within other traditions that emphasize a more rigorous uh, commitment to, to this non-dual way of looking at things, um, will still use the word oneness sometimes if it thinks it will it will help people. So people need a sense of wholeness. Um, and the idea of non-duality is rooted in an understanding that a huge amount of human suffering arises from a feeling of alienation, and separation. Um, and it's easy to see if you just think about like how, think about like with someone that you really love, you know, in your family or like a, a a romantic partner or something and how wonderful and complete it feels when you feel really connected and then think about like when you're having like a really tough argument how separate it feels and how wrenching that is it's that feeling of separation is is really hard and so you, you know you could argue we we have have that with so much of life we're, we're walking down the street and instead of really realizing we're a part of this whole thing we're like up in our head being like how the heck am i gonna get everything figured out so x and y doesn't happen or you know um so that's all alien separation and so well, you know talking about oneness is a relatively simple way to help people feel connected and whole which is just a psychologically valuable thing to do but non-duality uh, at least, you know, some some people talk about non-duality and what they mean is oneness, and I respect them and bow to them. It's fine. It's cool. Uh, but as someone who's like coming from this Mahayana Buddhist tradition where it has a more, uh, I would say it's a more challenging meaning personally, but whatever. Um, it has this other meaning, which is not just oneness, but actual non-dualness. So the, the importance of this is like when we have oneness, as I was saying, one of the most common things is people will try and paper over problems that exist by using oneness. So like I do a lot of multi-faith work and sometimes we'll have very difficult conflicts. You know, you have wrenching inter-religious conflicts all over the world, certainly um, between like, uh, 
Israel and Palestine is very much, I mean, it's a state issue, but it also has to do with Jewishness and, and Islamic people. And then there's conflict, you know, between Christian people and Islamic people in the United States, a lot of Islamophobia. Um, so anyway, I'll be sitting at the table and this will come up. Uh, and, and someone will want to just like go, well, let's just do, well, we're all, it's, we're, we're all one. And, and I've had to sit there while like an, a Muslim person talking to a, an evangelical Christian, Christian is like, we may all be one, but the website for your organization has false and insulting information about my religion. So as one as we might be, that feels pretty different. <laughs> so, so like you, you, oneness, it's like can help us feel connected, but it denies um, realities that we live in. And so that's why, like, I, I think Audre Lorde, as I say, puts it really well. It's like community, but distinction or seeing the coin, but also seeing the two sides, uh, however you want to do it. What non-duality presents is this endlessly rolling ball. So this is why, um, why people kind of don't like it. You'd be like, wouldn't it be easier to just be like, we're all one, it's fine. And instead I have to be like, no, I haven't got it figured out. I can't get it figured out because to figure it out, there would have to be an it, which is an object, which is a dualistic phenomena. So I don't get that. I only get moment to moment engagement with a flux of reality. To me, I feel really lucky. And the thing is, I just said what non-duality gives you is a moment to moment engagement with the flux of reality. I don't think you can get anything else anyway. So to me, non-duality is just like being truthful. I want to say that spring is separate from winter. That may seem very real to me, but it's not absolutely true. I may want to say that um, the people whose political views I think are terrible and oppressive are separate from me, but we're bound together in this world. And uh, yeah. So anyway, oh, someone's leaving. Sayonara. Nice to hang out with you, uh, Ella, Thank is you it? Bye-bye, Ella. Thank you. Anyway, Bye. that's something about uh, non-duality and oneness. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? Where are you at with that? I also want to, if someone has to leave, we'll, this will be recorded and it'll be on our YouTube channel too. So you okay. won't have to miss it. Cool. Anybody else? Jump in. Um, yeah. I have a thought. This can get very intellectual, as we know, um, both from the Zen side and the Theosophy side. Um, and I'm thinking about the meditation side because I know a lot of stuff, so you meditate because there's things you can talk about, but you have to have some like direct contact with it um, and how that plays in. Um, that's, a good, <laughs> that's a good point. So I spend uh, a half an hour a day talking about this and I spend an hour a day sitting in meditation so, uh, yeah, in fact, maybe we'll do some meditation. That would be fun. Um, so, yes. Now, I will say um, there are people who never do any meditation. And th their method for engaging this material is talking and thinking about it. And that can be really liberative. Um, but for all the traditions that I listed, the method for seeing non-self is to meditate and investigate the concepts of experience in a meditative manner and arrive at the realization of non-self. The mode for realizing no self is to sit and allow the activity of consciousness to quiet enough that consciousness doesn't turn the world into objects. And the way of realizing non-duality is actually very similar almost identical <laughs> um, uh, of just, you just kind of like do very, very little. Um, 
And then since you're not doing stuff, you're not trying to make things happen or figure anything out. And then you realize that it already isn't what you thought it was. And you can just realize um, that everything already is non-dual and it already is non-self and it is already no self. And in my experience, this is something that requires an enormous commitment to meditation to really deeply experience, but even a small commitment to meditation can evoke it um, to some degree. So I think that's just fun. Why don't we, you guys want to meditate? That'd be fun. I, kn I know how to teach meditation. Are, are people into it? Yep, this is a group that meditates for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, cool, let's do it. And then later maybe we could tap into the voice of the silence part because I don't, then you talked about some points in that. And uh, I think the absolute, which ties right into this stuff was, was part of the voice of the silence. And uh, Yeah, so let's I, do this. Yeah. Let's, let's do a meditation and then take a break and then we can see where, where, where it takes us. Sounds great. Um, so, you know, I have no idea how people are sitting because I can't see you. Uh, generally speaking, in the meditation tradition I'm trained in, posture is actually the main thing. Like things we do with our mind are totally secondary or tertiary, but however you're sitting is going to be fine. I do encourage you to find some way so that your, your lower body can be stable and you don't have to do anything to it. So at rest, feet at rest. Um, feeling the butt on the seat, perhaps the thighs in contact with the chair, wherever you're sitting. And letting the hands just rest in the lap or on the thighs. And then if you're sitting in a way that is possible to just find some length in the spine. It's like we feel our contact with the ground and then energize and lengthen on the spine. So the heart and the chest might open up a little bit as you inhale and that will open and extend the body. And then as you exhale, just let the body relax around that lengthening, opening and expansion. So we inhale and there's just opening and expanding up in the chest and the heart and exhalation, letting the body surrender to gravity. As we do this, Letting the spine become uh, long, strong, upright, and then letting the rest of the body just hang off the strength of the spine like a garment on a rack. And I just invite you to notice the physical sensations of breathing in the lower abdomen. And if you find you're unaware of the breathing, uh, that's, that's no problem. 
You can just bring your attention to your breathing. So just as if you were listening to a friend talk about something important to them, but there was um, some kind of distracting sound kept catching your attention. And when you notice that sound, you might realize, oh, I want to come back and listen to my friend because I care about them. What's the same quality? You don't have to do anything to whatever has drawn your attention away from the breath. You can just attend to the breath because you care about your own embodied experience. So mindfulness of the body is the first foundation of mindfulness in Buddhist teachings. And the first element of mindfulness of body is mindfulness of breathing. So we are establishing the foundation of mindfulness. When cultivating mindfulness, if you are not aware of the foundation, you can just become aware of the foundation. The sensations of breathing will be there. They'll always be different, unique, and they will be present.
So as we are bringing attention to the breathing, we'll be, there will be awareness of other things. So there may be sounds, or thoughts, There might be visual images. So if the eyes are open, you might see visual images you think of as outside yourself, or if the eyes are closed, there'll be visual images there as well. There may be emotions, feelings. perhaps smells or even tastes. Maybe a sense that there's a you that is perceiving phenomena, a self that is observing or something that's observing. Maybe sensations throughout the body. By resting attention and returning attention to the physical sensations of the breath, we can also naturally let our awareness be broad enough to include all of what is in the field of experience. We don't need to figure out or do anything to any of it. So you may find that the attention is on the breath and then your attention goes elsewhere. And when you notice the attention is elsewhere, you can just bring it to the breath. And then if you feel like there is some stability there, that there is some establishment to the foundation of mindfulness, you can just let your awareness expand to include all that is seen, felt, all the emotions, what is smelled, heard, what perceives and what is perceived. Gonna ring a bell and just be quiet for about five minutes.
All right. Well, I'm going to invite you to uh, begin to move the body and rearrange it to whatever shape seems beneficial. And uh, I think actually it would be good to take a little break here. Been sitting here for a while, so how about if we just come back and hang out in about five minutes? Five minutes. All right, everybody. See you shortly. This is what I'm interested in is uh, maybe people's reflection. Uh, you know, I think there are probably some like spiritual kind of people up in this meeting. Uh, you know, what, 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 is, what has been your experience around, like if I talk about feeling um, like there's not a you that's separate from the world or there's not a world of things to be manipulated. I mean, these are sound like philosophical concepts, but they're also just, they can be kind of like, oh, I, I experienced something like that once, you know? I felt so close to someone that I felt like the separation between us had disappeared or I was way, I, there was a time I remember being way less concerned about sort of protecting and holding on to myself. So I would just be interested to hear if people, you know, if the things that you're talking about resonated with your lived experience. Hey! Hi, Ben. I'm here. I, we only have one computer in here, so I'm. Yeah. I've been I'm meditating, listening. I wanted to say something about that. Um, I remember uh, quite a few years ago now, I was trying to understand who Berta was and what was unique about Roberta. And um, I was, I, I freaked myself out to say the least, because I realized that there was nothing that wasn't as of someone else. Mm. And so, it's, <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. And so, yeah, and the, I couldn't, I couldn't logic my way out of that. I just had to sit with it. And I'm still sitting with that idea. So I just wanted to throw that in today. It's kind of a different way of coming at it, but yeah. Oh, well, that, that seems like a good way of coming at it. So one of the main, the underlying techniques for thinking about how these are true is it's about how things are dependent. So you just yeah. look at the dependent nature of things like, oh, my whole personality, like there wouldn't be a me without my parents. You know, nothing about it is like uh not conditioned so yeah it is weird to think about <laughs> <laughs> weirded me out <laughs> you know yeah because we all sort of or, or myself in love with the idea of myself and individuality and all these things that i think i've created and no i haven't really created much yeah <laughs> so anyway thank you <laughs> Hi, I'm Erica. Hi. Hi. Um, in talking about this, um, I think I'm still pondering what non-duality is. So I'm not, and, and I'm a massage therapist and I've studied shiatsu. So from the Zen and the yin and yang and that, and having to do comparative duality as part of um, I guess it's part of the training with that trying to, I don't think I can marry those ideas together very well. Um, and I'm still, I'm, it, it's, it's, is non-dualism the same as being here and not being here? <laughs> that sounds like a, that sounds like a non-dual way of talking about something. But it's, it's a duality, but it's, it's, is, so non-dual is the lack of dualism? Correct. Or you could say the non-absolute truthness of dualism. 
the fact that any dualism is not an absolutely true thing. It's just a way of looking. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That that's more helpful because a, it, nothing is a true duality. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's much more helpful. Yeah, it's like duality is just perspective. And perspectives, yeah. it's cool. You know, I like having perspectives, but oh yeah, we and, act like they're absolutely true, right? That's the that. mm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's, I get maybe it's like saying there's no such thing as black and white. There's all the shades of gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that black and white are in the you. If you didn't have white, you wouldn't know what black was, and you wouldn't be yeah. able to call it black. Right. So, in order for their or in like in a more practical way what this ends up looking like is you know there are probably people who you think are like really terrible maybe not but you know it's pretty common for someone to be like that person is really terrible mm -hmm. you know good and evil are ideas mm -hmm. you, there has they have to interrelate and you might be like well that sounds you know is that just going to make us in some kind of moral vacuum and no, it doesn't. It just reminds us that we're in a relationship. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the genius like that underlies the civil rights movement. So in the letter from Birmingham jail, King writes, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. So the nonviolence mm -hmm. is the principle that underlies non-duality. And that we see that when you do violence to something or try and dominate or control or get or push away mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. that that's just producing more suffering. But if we can see that we're inseparably in relationship, we can find ways to act that aren't about uh, domination and control. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So duality is the illusion. Would you agree? Is that another way of saying it? Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the body of teaching that I value. So um, the imaginary nature of things is however they appear as dual. And their real nature is that they are not that, whatever that is. Is that another way of saying, um, and I can't understand it well enough to talk about this, but in quantum physics, um, the quantum entanglement, is that another, is that like a underlying reality? I mean, or expressing the underlying reality of non-dualism. Because there's quantum entanglement in everything. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. I would say that generally speaking, the way I tend to think about this from what I know of quantum field theory is that the in the quantum field, a lot of the things that are happening seem to resemble the way the universe is described in non-dual religious traditions. Um, yeah. But I do think that there are a number of people who overextend that commonality, and they're basically saying quantum physics has proven that, you know, non-dual philosophers were right, and and they're they're not it, that that's a false oneness in my opinion, and so it it can be useful, it can be a way of talking about it that helps us to see it, um, and we can be like, well, that's a really weird commonality. Um, and I would say the main difference is that the principle of non-duality in Buddhism is entirely and exclusively for the purpose of alleviating suffering. And quantum physics has been used to create weapons of mass destruction. So the reasoning for why you use the way of looking at things really, really matters. Not to say that quantum physics hasn't used to be beautiful and cool things too, but the basic idea is that non-duality from the religious perspective is a way of helping people be more free from suffering and help other people get free. Interesting. Thank you.
this is almost leading me a little bit into another area that could just make things another layer of confusing things. Um, uh, absolute versus relative, because we were talking about absolute a bit. And, and there's duality, non-duality, then there's absolute relative. How does that tie into all this, or does it? Yeah, yeah. Do, do you, um, <clears throat> does, does Blavatsky use some kind of version of absolute and relative in her teaching? I believe so. Now, Voice of the Silence, Vaughn, maybe you'd know this better than I do, but. Um, um, yes, yes. There was. Yes, she speaks of the absolute. And it's, you know, it's also been discussed whether it is the absolute to the absolute, um, absolute to source, absolute to humanity in our evolution, in our. Our spiritual evolution would be a return to the absolute, which is also the way she more or less describes the ultimate reality. Yeah, and a lot of her, a lot of her writings were based on on um, uh, Tibetan Mahayana. So there is that, there is that influence for sure behind. Um, yeah, so that's sounding very much, I mean, the, the terms that are being used, you know, absolute and ultimate reality, uh, Paranish, I could, like, you have the Sanskrit terms that are being translated there. So, yeah, the, the one thing to know is that within Buddhism, there's huge amounts of philosophical dis disputation. Like, it's, it's comical to me. It's just like, wow, you know, you guys are down in the weeds with this stuff. So... <laughs> Like I'll talk, I'm going to talk about this as if like, ah, it's really like this, but I swear, you know, if you got like a Galikpa Tet Tibetan teacher, they'd be ready to debate me down to the, you know, it'd be lots of fun <laughs> for someone. Anyway, um, <laughs> what I can say that I think is a fairly reasonable summation um, is that it, the absolute and the relative are known as the two truths in Mahayana Buddhism. So uh, a great way to understand the absolute and the relative is using um, uh, dependence. So if you remember when I was talking about this earlier, I talked about how like the piece of paper is dependent on everything. The idea that each thing arises from other conditions underlies the, all these things we're talking about today in Buddhism. That's kind of like the, the basis. And so with absolute and relative, the basic argument is the relative nature is something is whatever you think it is. Um, so that is to say, like, I think there's a hand and that's like separate from the room and from the rest of my body, which is, you know, pretty reasonable crank. So that's called the relative, sometimes called the conventional truth. But the fact that there's a hand is dependent on um, the fact that there's an arm because it, it wouldn't be here without it. And of course, it's dependent on like a bunch of food that I ate. So it's a, depends on an entire food system. Um, it's dependent on my awareness that I have to eat food in order to keep this hand existing and on massive evolutional processes that have happened for thousands of years. And again, we could just go on and on. So it's entirely dependent on non-hand things. So the relative thing, which is the hand or the conventional thing, which is a hand, is entirely dependent on non-hand things. So it is empty of handness. It's full of non-hand things. And that emptiness of handness is its absolute truth. So the absolute truth is that the hand is empty of handness. And the relative truth is that it's a hand. And the two truths says, yeah, they're both good. They're, it's not called like a lie and the truth. It's called the two truths. So this is kind of back to that thing of like affirming both sides of the duality while realizing the duality is not absolutely true. So we can see how that ties to non-duality. And then this ties to the idea of um, things being illusion uh, in that from a, the language used in the yoga char is we say the hand is imaginary 
because it's mental processes that make me think it's separate from everything else. So instead of saying it's um, relative or conventionally say it's imaginary, and then we use the language that I think Vaughn used, um, instead of saying it's absolute, we say it's complete or fulfilled or um, realized. I use, in the, when I'm translating these texts, I use complete realized nature. It's complete realized nature is that it isn't the hand that I think it is. The complete realized nature is everything, is that everything always isn't what you think it is. Um, but the imaginary nature is really important. And this is very important to know. The reason we call it imaginary is because then we can remember that in every moment we're actively engaged in imagining what the world will be for everyone. So our actions, moment to moment, always have impact because we're contributing to the way human beings and other sentient beings will view the world. And that influences how we treat each other, how we feel, and that is really where the rubber hits the road. And one of the things that I was taught the most in, in the practice is also the thought because the thought form goes and can attach or so um, what am I imagining? And then what am I drawing to myself or putting upon, you know, even it gets complicated, but um, that part of the action is actually the thoughts, but I, it's not like, okay, so there's this really um, kind of new age, la di da, I call it, where they say, well, if you think that you're gonna create it, like, just like that. It's like, no, it's not that either. It, it's way more than that little idea. So I just wanted to throw that in, that the thought too, it's act, thought is action. Yeah, that's a great in point. A Very rich because Yes, so thought and action, the word action in, um, the word for action, one of the common words for action in Indian thought is karma. And so uh, Buddha defines, he says, karma is thought. In intention, the words have a lot of overlapping meaning. So the point, this is really a different way of looking at the world. The idea is the way we act, think, feel, and perceive is what actually has impact. So, and this is, so this is a really different worldview. So normally I'm trained to think that there's a world of absolute material objects and what matters is how I affect those real objects. So um, I move things around, I acquire things, I change things outside of myself, and that's what really is impact. And that's a reasonable worldview that I, I, I like hold because it's very, very trained into my mind. But Buddhism instead says what actually has impact is the way we think, perceive, feel, and act in the world because those plant the seeds, that's the metaphor we use generally, that will create the next imaginations. But your point is really good. This teaching does not at all say that if you just like, I'm just gonna imagine getting a really new Lexus and then I will get one. Actually, what this says is what you did in that moment is a lot of what you planted was seeds of desire so that sentient beings will experience desire um, and sort of ideas that having um, expensive complex machinery will make you happy and so forth. Now you might end up getting the car because people do, you know, I have been like, I really want to get a, another car. And then I did. So that, that also happens, but you put it pretty well. It's way more complex than that. So within Buddhist karma theory, we plant the seeds. You have no idea when they were built, bear fruit, and you don't know exactly how they were built, bear fruit. But the main thing is that the quality of your attention is what actually has impact. And to sum up this whole thing, the whole point <laughs> is to put you in the seat of realizing you have liberative power every moment. You're always impacting how the world will be created. 
So what you do really matters. And uh, from what I remember of the Voice of the Silence, Blavatsky, well, she, claimed she did not write it, but um, basically um, was bringing uh, information for a uh, text that she remembered that she made, it was quite a point of before you start going down the spiritual path and doing things, you got to really be kind of purify yourself. Um, your thought, like, you know, like the thoughts and feelings and all that and be, you know, be pure, be, be egoless about striving towards things. Or you can just make trouble. That's kind of a overly simplified description. <laughs> but yeah, all on big points. It's easy to make trouble. I've made plenty. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Even if you don't mean to, it can happen. So if you're, if there's too much you, in yeah. The, in the, Yeah, we had John. Urban people was like, Go on. Uh, Go I was going to say there. I I see. I think there people maybe their vibe is they're like I just like to come to this meeting and listen, which is cool. But if there are people who haven't been saying anything and you want to say something, I I think it's cool to hear people say things. It's fun. Or if you're shy, write it in the chat and I'll read it. Yeah. Well, uh, comparing this to uh, Blavatsky, who did who did study Buddhism in in Tibet with her partner, so many similarities, but different words perhaps. She spoke of the um, the shadow world. She said we live in a shadow world, the, a re reflective light. Everything is material like reflecting off of everything as a consequence. And I've seen this in the Yoga Sutras too. The concept that you, we can never truly know what is truly real. And in, in this world, in this life, in this material life we live, in the shadow world. But she said that, that beyond this, you know, there would be not answers for us. But I think she said realization and you'll have to deal with that just realization she said it might not be the answers you want it's going to be the realization and it's like oh <laughs> at least we're not living in the world of shadow <laughs> yeah it's interesting because i think that that resonates in many ways. Well, it's funny. I hear like Plato's allegory of the cave. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, the, you know, the body of teaching, the Yogacara teachings that I'm most into, they do say, this is fun. You like this sort of thing. You <laughs> totally can know what is absolutely real. And actually, even weirder, it's the only thing you can ever know. And this is why we have non duet all you're knowing right now is a bunch of imaginary nature it's like you have this moment where it seems like there's a you i'm guessing observing things and there's sounds which are different than sights and there's colors that are different colors all that is is a bunch of dualities that manifest in your field of consciousness because of your conditioning to just like boom millions of dualities created every second amazing pretty cool but the thing is they already aren't those dualities. And this is the really freaky thing about these teachings. They're saying all realization is and all realness is, is that the dualities aren't real. And they already aren't real. So the only thing you ever experience is the same thing Buddha's experience, which is that everything isn't the dualities you think it is. So non-duality is so strange. Um, but that, and that's, uh, sometimes it sounds like, oh, this is just a bunch of blah, blah, blah talking. The point is, the claim of the tradition is that when you see what is real, there isn't suffering and there's clarity 
about what you can do that will create non-suffering. And the claim is that comes from being able to see that the dualities aren't absolutely real. That there's a, a freedom from the patterns that condition us to suffer and create suffering. And so the idea that everything already is realization is, is to just give us some affirmation. Because it's, it, you know, it works for some people, but having a tradition that says, ah, you're, you're bound to suffering and maybe you'll get out in five million years or, you know, you'll die and go to heaven. That's cool. You know, some people are super into it. But I just love that I get to be in a tradition where I sit down with my students and I can be like, well, I'm sorry, it's too late. You're already Buddha. Can't do anything about it. <laughs> and the struggle is everything, right? Certainly feels that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, the uh, yeah. struggle isn't real. I just said the struggle isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you. You know that that makes me think of an experience I had. The struggle, the struggle seems like is everything. The struggle seems like everything. The struggle isn't real. All just reasonable ways to look at and talk about our experience. But I just remember one time, I I used to go to a, a addiction recovery meeting on Thursday nights, and I it was like you know like a life saving respite, and I had to work beforehand, and so I would be working. And I would get done working in my house and have to like rush to get to the thing. And, and it would be really, I would get really stressed. I'd be really stressed because I wanted to be there on time. I wanted to be there for the people. I wanted to get my medicine. And oh, so I'd just be so wound up week after week. And I was like, I'm so busy. I have to work and work and work. And then I can just barely get to this thing that I have to do to just try and survive. Ah, and so I was like, I drove my automobile to get to this meeting. I didn't even have time to ride my bike. And I got there and I, so grumpy. And it's like, there's two minutes before the meeting starts. And I pulled in the parking lot and I was like, I'm so busy. And I thought, how can I be busy? There's just like, like my butt in a seat and like raindrops on this windshield. And there's breathing happening. And like this mind is thinking about something like, ah, I'm busy. And these emotions that are like, ah, it's hard. And I was just like, it, busy, it's an idea. It's not a possible thing. You're never not where you are. And it was like, I didn't like figure all that out. I just been meditating every day for years. And having people support me, and I just had a moment where I just realized busy isn't real. And from that time, sometimes I'll feel busy, or I'll think busy. But oftentimes I can just be like, oh, wait, that's just an idea. It is not a real thing. And uh, the affliction is sometimes abates a little bit. Which is nice. Quiet people jump in. Now's your chance. Yeah, I was wondering you you were talking about the the Buddha, so what is a Buddha? Ooh, fun questions. <laughs> um, so Buddha means awake or awakened one or awakeness. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from one perspective, a Buddha is a religious icon that mm -hmm. represents um, compassion and wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, Buddha also just refers to um, one of my favorite quotations about Buddha is from a Yogacara text, which says, 
It is the naturally pure cognition of every sentient being that is indicated by the term Buddha. It is the naturally pure cognition of every sentient being which is indicated by the term Buddha. So this is going back to what I was saying earlier that your field of experience, my field of experience, that's like cognition, the, our perception of the world, um, is already not any of the dualities that we think it has. And so it's already pure of those dualities which cause suffering. So it's naturally pure. And, and what a Buddha is, is someone who knows that's true. Mm, I see. You already don't know anything else because all we ever know is this, whatever's happening mm -hmm. right now, and it's already not any of the things that we think it is. So, <laughs> Buddha. Oh. <laughs> Enjoy so it! About, so what about uh, war and those kinds of things? Uh, how does that enter in in all this? Yeah, so because we're Buddha, like when I realized that, well, what's Buddha is about? It's about wisdom and compassion. So that means I should be compassionate and wise as best I can right now. Uh -huh. So there's, oh, there's war. What can I do in relation to that? How can I embody and enact my Buddhahood? So another way to think about this I hope you'll see this relationship. A while back, I heard a talk by a Dakota elder named Bob Klanderud. And so he came and he was talking about how the area in which we live is near Bedote, which is the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. Hmm. And Bedote in the Dakota worldview is the origin of the universe. And so he talked about um, the brutality um, that his ancestors had experienced at the hands of white settlers like my family members and the extreme racism and oppression he had experienced during his lifetime so we're you know you're talking about like war and so forth so yeah he's talking about this quite vividly and then and he's talking about and we are here near bedote which is eden in, in my tradition, he said, we are in Eden. And he said, so now I've told you you live in Eden. How are you going to act? Hmm. Wow. So this is the same basic message. When, when a teacher from Buddhism tells you you're already Buddha, the point is to evoke in you the energy to enact your Buddhahood. What can you, what can I do to help with this war and with famine and with oppression? Mm -hmm. So are they, are they real or are they not real? Uh, war and famine and oppression? Yeah. They're conventionally real, or we could say they are collectively imagined. The point being that we are making them together. I see. Okay. We are making those things together. And, mm -hmm. and we can imagine something different. We can make a different world. The promise of Buddhism is that we have agency to alleviate suffering. I see. So the, the thing is, what this shifts us off is thinking of like, uh, the problem is out there. It keeps trying to find a way to frame it so we realize we have, we can do something about it. So it's not an objective thing, but a thing in which we are intimately related. We are caught, as Dr. King said, in an inescapable network of mutuality. So would recognizing our Buddhahood, that we are Buddhas, be a step towards alleviating that suffering? 
It can be. It can be kind of hard, though, because you're like, oh, you told me I'm Buddha, and I just did something really stupid and obnoxious. I'm not being a <laughs> Buddha. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so it can, it can feel like a lot of pressure. So it's good to remember, this is just words. We're just right. using the words to try and evoke some things that might help people, you know, do something helpful. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. The, the downside, you know, and then it's like if someone seems kind of grandiose and like they've got it all figured out and they're really awesome, I'm not going to spend my time talking about how they're Buddha. <laughs> true, true. I hear that. Yeah. You know, does that make sense? So it's kind of like a lot of people feel kind of broken, or there's something fundamentally wrong with them, and that doesn't help. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think what I, I try, what I was trying to allude to is that being, I kind of equate it as like the same turning within, recognizing our beingness mm. or being that, just being mindful of everything and contributing to our world around us is how we can affect the entire network of, what was the term? the network of community collective is collect collective what did he say <laughs> what what does he say we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality it, the <laughs> network of mutuality is that how we can contribute to this network of mutuality in maintain tr attempting to maintain this attitude of of mindfulness of peacefulness Granted, it might not happen at the grocery store, but. <laughs> Mindfulness is great at the grocery store. Oh. Every time you purchase an item, think about mm. 10 things on which that item depends. That's oh, wow. Awesome yeah. Mindfulness. Um, oh. Or just notice the other people there and how they feel. So but what I'll say is uh, mindfulness is not the whole thing. Mindfulness is mostly about dismantling our habits that cause us to suffer and cause harm. So they, they, it enables us to see what's going on with us. Um, but it's also good to use speech that is kind and beneficial. And to, um, you know, with mindfulness, we become less focused on getting things for ourselves. And so we become more generous, hopefully. But the, the generosity itself matters. Uh, whether you're mindful or not. So there, there's like so many ways to contribute to non-suffering that people do. Um, but, you know, my interest is in helping people focus on the fact that, that, that there, are, there are things they can do. And you don't have to be in a huge hurry to do it. That's what, that's what I like you bringing up mindfulness because mindfulness is more about slowing down. I mean, the thing is, I know a lot of people like we want to like save everybody and we run around and light a bunch of things on fire doesn't help so slowing down and and doing our our caring for the world in a way that's that's self-aware um and focused on relationship that seems to work a little better gandhi he um uh, chose friday to be the day he didn't talk or use his voice and he usually didn't meet with people. They occasionally he'd make an exception, uh, it, but he would write notes then. But he recognized that he couldn't be in action all the time. He had to take a day where he was more thoughtful. And, and you know, he probably would have burned out if he was doing stuff here you know, all the time, you know. Totally feeling that. I'm... I <laughs> I spend three weeks usually in silent retreat personally, I spend an hour a day in meditation. I just take slow walks around my neighborhood looking at trees. That, for Personally, that's just the way I've been encouraged to practice and that, that creates energy for me to be involved in my community in other ways. So yeah, this, um, yeah, awesome. Yes, take a day off, find a Shabbos, <laughs> whatever. Whatever your way is. It's almost nine, people.
We've been we've been like party until the break of dawn on some non-duality, non-self, and no-self. How cool is that? Um, I could see wrapping up this party. Does someone else want to bring something into the room? One thing I'm just mindful of right now is that we have, I remember many years ago, a, a very wise person predicted a, quite a bit of the unfolding dramas that have been happening in the last couple of years, you know, maybe a prophetic kind of guy. And he said, I remember he just looked around the room and we were in, you know, just Minnesota, Unity of the Valley, actually. And he said, you all will have the privilege of quietness and ease and support and that isn't going to be the case everywhere and so you get to go deep into your spirituality now so don't waste that time and then be present and hold space for all of the chaos to quiet and see a better world coming you know and i've just always remembered that admo i don't know what to call it like an admonishment or a, just a truth bomb that said see a better world coming your job is to be in meditation and see a better world coming don't focus on what that chaos is be behind the short wall and observe so that you can see a better world coming and he just kept saying that i'm like okay wow and it was so theoretical then and that's like oh wow it's not theoretical now so that seems pretty buddhist to me he was not buddhist but Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, see what's here. We get better at just seeing what's here, knowing the breath, knowing the phenomena of the moment. And we, we begin, begin to be able to meet what's in our hearts, what we feel and what other people feel with more compassion. And then as we become aware of that, it becomes more clear what we can do that will actually help. So, uh, I'm, I appreciate what y'all are doing here over here at the Theosophical Society, uh, making making your own fascinating way towards some a little bit of freedom from suffering. So I appreciate being included. Thank you so much for being here. I am so honored that you spoke to us, and I just love the way your mind thinks. I remember that from hearing you before. So thank you so much. Kathleen says she's very happy she listened to this. It's very interesting and relaxing. She says thank you. Oh, thank nice. you for being here, Kathleen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May you be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.